Um, can I get your name? And if you could spell it, that would be great. Okay. M-A-R-I-A-R-O-S-S-O-T-O, Maria Rosso. Okay. And my name's Suzanne <coughs> Bennett, and we're in Atlanta, Georgia on November 28th, 2012 for a Religious Lives interview. Okay, the first thing that we we're going to talk about for a while is religion in your childhood. And what we want to know is what your first memory is concerning religion in your childhood. And if you could recall a specific moment or an event, that would be wonderful. Um. There was a picture of Jesus um, above the door. So when you walked out of the house every time, you could look at Jesus. And one day I noticed it. Like it was always there, but one day I noticed it. And I was like, well, who's that? (laughs) Because he's not a relative I've seen. not look Hispanic um, and um, and I couldn't understand any explanation that was given that's probably my very 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 first is memory and going the only time that I had to go to church really was I think holidays or something and but my parents were Catholic and we lived in a Mexican neighborhood all Mexican neighborhood so the Catholic you know my dad's Spanish so the church we would go to would be full of like it was it'd be kind of scary because a lot of old women in shawls crying and you know <laughs> yeah and and it's very intense and I didn't understand anything that was going on and I went to catechism they sent me to catechism that's what you call it right mm-hmm. it's like after school and um because I didn't go to my other brothers and sisters went to like a Catholic school. Okay. But I, I went to public, and so they sent me to catechism, and they were trying to tell us like the story from the Bible and stuff, and I kept asking them what, what are you talking about? Like, what is this you're talking about? Was this is this real? You know. Like, and they couldn't answer any of my questions to my satisfaction. And, uh, so I went home and said I quit. <laughs> that was it. That was it. <laughs> that, yeah. And I was, what, like, seven or eight years old? Eight years from something like that. Where was this? In San Antonio, Texas. Okay. And... Do you remember what the church looked like? Was it was it kind of your typical Catholic church, stained glass windows, things like I that? I don't know. I mean, that was so long ago. I, it's like dark. Incense? Yeah. I don't remember incense. I don't know, because it was like I didn't go enough for it to leave an impression that was, mm-hmm. you know, s- stamped in my memory from repetition or anything like that. It was like... I probably just spaced out or something. If they had music on in the music or something, I have no idea. I just remember ladies in shawls. Like, <laughs> what's going on? What's going on? Why is everybody so not happy? You everybody know? wasn't happy? Yeah, it'd be like pain or something. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh. Now, were there any religious practices that you had in your house other than going to church and from what you're saying you were going to church only every once in a while yeah I mean just like maybe a holiday um, like Christmas or something okay I guess that's basically around Christmas um mm, no cause even though like we didn't pray at meals or something like that um there was no like Oh, praise God, you know, praise Jesus or nothing like that, when, you know. Um, or don't do this, you're going to hell. But somehow I learned about all that stuff, mm-hmm. more like at school, mm-hmm. you know. I learned it more like at school because, I, you know, it seemed like being in a Mexican neighborhood, everybody was Catholic, 
mm-hmm. and superstitious. Superstitious? Yeah. More superstitious to me than like religious. Can you explain that? Like like can you remember some of the superstitions? Yeah, like um okay, I'm in school maybe third you know second, third grade, something like that. And um and I drop a pencil or something. For some reason I have to bend over and my head is toward the ground. And I'm searching for whatever it was I dropped. And the kid next to me tells me I better get up. I better get my head up. Because if I leave my head down, the devil is going to enter it. And I'm like, really? I was more amused than like, holy shit, you know, I got to... <laughs> I've got to evade the devil right now. Someone help me with my pencil. You know, it was like... It was more like, wow... You just said that, <laughs> you know. I, I think I came into the world with more of a curiosity than a mm-hmm. need. Were your parents superstitious? Was your mom superstitious, Grandma? I don't think so. My mother's Polish Catholic, and um, um, she was more. You could call her more of a witch, you know. Um. She's more of a witch. I wouldn't say she was superstitious. My grandmother was a witch. But the Mexican grandmother, the Spanish grandmother, actually not Mexican. Mm-hmm. She, um, so I don't, you know, so I grew up with a little magic, you know, like. Superstition to me is different from supernatural. Okay. And different from religion. Okay. So, I didn't really grow up with any religion. Okay. They had Jesus on the door, probably because they both grew up that way, and that's, if you didn't, you might feel like, oh, shit, you know, I'm right. not supposed to have that, but my dad is really agnostic, you know, and I just didn't push it on us. My brothers and sisters went to parochial school because, I think because they thought they would get a better education and be, mm-hmm. it would be better off right. than going to public school. Um, and they probably just ran out of money. Okay. And it was my turn. <laughs> you were the youngest of five, is it? No, I was four or five. Four. Yeah, and then four my younger okay. brother actually did. He went to religious school. But it was a Hebrew school. So, that was different. Um, and I avoided that as well. I was the lucky one. So, but, like my grandmother, the Spanish grandmother who I wish I could have spoken to because she only spoke Spanish and I could not have a conversation with her. And um, she was a little scary to me because she was old and wrinkly and she would just talk furiously at me in Spanish and I would have no idea what she was saying, <laughs> you know? And I'm sure it was disappointing to her to have this little half-white kid, you know, half-white grandkid who's just like, oh, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> You know, yeah, poor lady. But now, you know, like when as I grew up and understood what she was doing and stuff, and I was like, dang, I wish I could have talked to her because um, she was a bruja and she grew herbs and stuff. Like she would always give us herbs, like give us chamomile. And I grew up herbally, not with medicine. So, I mean, medicine in extreme cases, but for the common complaints. <laughs> You know, it would be herbal cares always, you know. Um, and she'd give us chamomile and she grew loofah sponges and you would have loofah stuff. And, um, which is funny to see them in the store, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, she, and she grew all kinds of different herbs, which growing up I would know the Spanish name too. Mm-hmm. And then later I understood what the English was, you know. Uh-oh. And now I forgot the Spanish. <laughs> That's like my brain can only have so much knowledge. But um, but my mother like was really in tune with her in that way, you mm-hmm. know, and um, would was very curious and would learn all about the herbs and stuff because she definitely didn't grow up like that. And mm-hmm. so um, she would learn how to use herbs and poem and stuff. And. Uh, and, like, one time, my brother was really, really sick. 
my younger brother, he was always sick. Always sick. And he would have these dangerously high temperatures and ear infections mm-hmm. and things and stomach stuff. He was just always sick. And uh, they and they just, we were really poor and they just couldn't afford to keep going to the doctor, the mm-hmm. hospital, or what have you, even, uh, even to the public the hospital. And um, I guess like the great equipment. And uh, so they, they brought her in one time, and I remember that because at least I was conscious of like, there's a thing going on. They brought, we, I don't remember her name, oh, I think it was Rosa, but of course we grew up calling her Abuelita, mm-hmm. you know, like the Mexican chocolate. And because uh, it means grandma. And um, so they bring Abuelita over, and uh, she gives instructions like, you have to get. It was just like in the cartoons when the witch says, I need an eye of toad. And uh, it was just like that. It was like, just like that. It was like an odd assortment of things. Um, not eyes of anything, or you didn't have to kill anything. But I remember a broom was one of the things. Which was, but, yeah. Brooms have significance in different cultures, right? So. Um, and I don't remember the other things because it was so long ago. Um, but anyway, my mother gathered these items, gave them to her, and then we were instructed that nobody could be in the room with her and my little brother, my sick little brother. So we didn't get to watch, you know, but it was just like Santeria and stuff. You don't get to hang out with them if, and watch mm-hmm. a ceremony if you're not initiated, you know. So, um, missed out on that but you know we're like in the house going but you know and as a kid like I must have been eight or nine or something like that you know mm-hmm. and uh, um, they don't tell you anything you know they don't regard you as a full person and don't tell you anything you know so you have to pick up your own bits and pieces of stuff ask mm-hmm. questions relentlessly or until you no, you can't. <laughs> and and just work with what you got, you know. So I have missing pieces of information, like, you know, how many times did that happen in the house? Right. You know. Do you remember your brother getting better? He did. He did. Absolutely got better. Like, they didn't have to take him to the doctor, the hospital, nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, he got better. So, yeah. I grew up thinking, you know, you use herbs to heal, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, die from sickness, you know, because we would be sick, we would have those horrible coughs that kids get, like a whooping cough, but not actually a whooping cough, mm-hmm. but where you just try to breathe and you cough, we would get them so bad, because, you know, we were just poor or whatever. And so you say you believed you don't die from sickness. Right, because we would be so ill and just not die. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> you think you're gonna die, you're like, dang, I didn't die. You know, so you yeah. believe in the strength of the body, you mm-hmm. know, the body's ability to cure, mm-hmm. you know, and that food is medicine. You know, grew up learning that, and I still practice that. Herbs, food is medicine, mm-hmm. you know, and if I had a choice between a blue cup and a Western doctor, I mean, if we're not talking about broken arms and stuff, I'd go with the blue cup. Yeah. You know, yeah, because I, you know, I think the condition of the body and the condition of the mind is part of an entire system, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's what the group house works with, mm-hmm. you know. Now, you said your mother was a witch? I, I would consider her a witch, yeah. Did she do any kind of practices at home that you remember or say anything or to you about it? No, she was very insincerely strange, very strange woman. Like, I think she considered herself a gypsy. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, of actual gypsy blood, you know, from where the the Polish borders and gypsy encampments are. And she looked like one. And... She was like really intense and psychic, mm-hmm. and um, she was weird. 
She was just weird. Mm-hmm. And yeah, somehow I consider her a witch. Just like yeah. using weed. Like, naturally a witch. Not, she didn't go find a uh, Wiccan meetup and, <laughs> and <laughs> learn <laughs> And learn how to be a pagan or something like that. She had like, she had the sight, you know. Did she have altars in the house or do tarot or anything yes. like that? Maybe you know, it's... no, she, she girl didn't need any cards. She did not need cards. Um, Can you remember a specific example of? Of her her vision, her sight, like when she may have said that something was coming. She would meet people and give you a profile. Wow. I know. And then it was a little creepy. And you'd be like, you know, like I would think, you know, like as a teenager later and stuff, you grow your consci- consciousness. I would think, you know, are you just judgmental or what? But she could just read people and she could feel. She could just feel stuff and and just know. Mm-hmm. And she, she wasn't a regular person. Like she couldn't relate to people mm-hmm. that I could see. She couldn't connect and relate like I can mm-hmm. and you can. She was on a different plane or something. Oh, interesting. You know? and, wow. Well, it's made for an interesting mother daughter relationship. I'm sure. As well. oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, to. Um, like I, I I learned pretty early on like just trust what she's saying because she she was just on. Yeah. You know, she was on and she didn't like having her powers and stuff, like she called it. She's like, I don't want this I don't wanna know. I don't wanna see. I don't wanna know. She would have presences in the room with her. Mm-hmm. Things like that. Mm-hmm. And um Sometimes she would see things before, but I cannot think of a specific instance. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, yeah. Now, were you ever um, exposed to people of other religions? I mean, other than the fact your mom was a witch, <laughs> um, a witch um, when you were a child. Were most of the people around you Catholic? Um, until I was about 10 years old, everybody was Catholic. Okay. Yeah. It's, I mean, we were like on the west side. It's like very okay segregated. So you don't remember there weren't any people of other religions? Okay. Not at all. Now, nobody else in the neighborhood but Mexicans. You did say that your brother went to Hebrew school? Yeah. Why? Well, because that's what I say, up until about 10 years old. When I was 10, um, like 10, 10, 11, um, my parents, who had, it seems, never got along. Mm-hmm. Like, there was just always just all the strife and chaos in the house. Constant, yeah. constant drama. And she couldn't get divorced. She didn't have any job skills, couldn't drive a car. Had four kids and no skills, no education. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she stayed in the marriage and uh, and he did too. I, I don't know why he's loyal. And uh, so they, they, I don't know how it started, how they, I don't know how they Connected to the Jewish community, but somehow they both caught on to this Jewish thing. They got the Jewish fever, and and they converted. They converted. They converted the both of them from Catholicism to Judaism. They both studied. Even neither of them. I mean, one's got a, a little bit of high school. The other didn't get through middle school. Um, but they studied and they whatever and got through the thing and did their ceremonies and became Jewish and and it was a, a like a way for them to reconciliate the marriage mm-hmm. you know it's like let's, let's make this work mm-hmm. and uh, so all of a sudden you're having satyrs <laughs> right right all of a sudden we're like can we still have Christmas because Christmas is cool you know 
And so when, you're, when your parents convert to Judaism, anybody under 12 in the household is an automatic Jew. So me and my little brother were automatic Jews. Because I was under 12. But I was like getting into bat, bat mitzvah age. Mm -hmm. So they sent me to Hebrew school. So after school, all of a sudden, I'm thrown in to this Jewish culture. Like, after school, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You know, now I got to be with the Jewish kids and learn Hebrew and learn about Jewish culture. And... And all these kids have, you know, lawyer daddies and doctor daddies and big houses and, you know, none of my clothes fit right. I look like hell, you know. I can't even brush my hair. You know, I'm like this wild child and I know I don't fit in. I've got horrible self-esteem. And then I'm put in a situation where it's like I'm totally intimidated by these kids, you know. And I'm supposed to do what? Learn this religion? And, and then I'm hit again with these Bible stories and going like what is this what is this that these people are doing out here with these stories if they had been told to me in a manner of like this is a myth and these are symbolic mm -hmm. you know tales um, I could get that Right. But they act like they're real people and even if they are they don't tell it in a manner that I can understand that it's symbolic. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, I just couldn't get it. So, but my little brother, instead of going to public school, they sent him to Hebrew school. And he actually spoke Hebrew. It's pretty weird. It's like, and he's going to do what with that? <laughs> and now he's a lawyer. He's a lawyer. So, us, you know, yeah. He had it, he, he didn't live where we originally lived, like, long at all so he didn't get teamed that way but mm -hmm. and then he goes into a nice school with like kids from an uh, affluent circle of mm -hmm. like he had a whole different experience than the rest of us mm -hmm. <laughs> we went to schools where I mean, it was just like a whole different whole different ball game yeah I don't know he's a lawyer a Jewish lawyer I don't know if he's still Jewish but give your mother's dream yeah so that's how that happened wow well, when you were a child, so let's say this was this was you know ten or eight or nine or ten. If someone were to have asked you what your religion was or how you identified religiously, what would you have said? I pray to the moon. You pray to the moon. Okay. <laughs> so no Jewish, no Catholic. Okay, I'm, well, I'm gonna actually pray, pray to the moon. You did pray to the moon. I'm gonna actually pray to the moon. Yeah, it was the only power I understood. Okay, can you can you get into that a little bit? First of all, where did you come up? Where did this idea originate from? Was it something that was taught to you? No, I probably just went outside. You went outside. <laughs> I mean, the moon is like powerful. It's it's beautiful and it's magical and it's it's stunning. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's got a power to it. And I didn't have anything else to pray to. I understood the concept of prayer. You know, I understood that. Um, and um, but I didn't have anything to pray to I wasn't going to pray to Jesus or the Virgin I didn't get that whole thing at all <laughs> and <laughs> you know and, then, and it was like there has to be something that can that I can some power that I can appeal to because I have nothing here Growing up, nothing I can believe in, mm -hmm. rely upon, latch on to. So I pray to the moon. I would go outside and just like stare at the moon and just pray to the moon, like, please get me out of here. Please get me out of here. Please get me out of here. That would be my prayer, basically. I didn't have any further ritual to it. Um, just. And what is the prayer if it's not just an intense longing? So please get me out of here, meaning your your state, your family, your... Out, of, out of the household. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, out of the household. I, I I didn't know from example, but I knew just because I'm a hopeful person that there had to be a better way of doing life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it didn't. 
had to be. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about when you moved. Um, so you're going from your childhood now into adolescence. So I think you've touched upon it a little bit, but you know, 12, 13 years old. Were you living in the same neighborhood? No, we actually moved and uh, moved around a bit. Oh, yeah. Um, before I was 10 or thereabouts, I lived a couple places. I forgot. I stayed with some people on a farm once who I thought were going to adopt me. And they did not. Um, but they, and they were German. And didn't have any sort of religious anything there. Uh, and then I stayed with, um, like things would get really rough at the house, and so I would, you know, go stay somewhere else. Um, I'm trying to think. I remember going to this house. Um, Somebody that my mother knew from some, somewhere. She had a really nice house. It was awesome. She had a really nice house in the hill country in San Antonio, which is like north of the city. And um, kind of out in the country ish, mm -hmm. sort of. And uh, she had a screen and porch in the back. And you could sit and listen to the rain. And she made candles. And it was so serene there. Mm -hmm. And there were no men in the house. And, because for some reason her husband was like not around. And, uh, it was so, it was just so quiet and beautiful. And she had a piano. I'd sit there and teach myself how to play and read music. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to learn. And uh, I don't remember any religion happening there, but I just remember that sense of like, that's probably where, um, also where I got the idea of life could be so different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was cool. That was so cool. I remember that man walking through, just walking, being able to walk by myself because it was safe out there, you know, considered safe. Just walk and be by myself and just quiet. Just I remember it was fall because there were a lot of leaves and stuff. Just like, wow. Get to breathe. Yeah. For once. Yeah. You know, and I, was, I was about 10. So, yeah. Ugh, it was a yucky childhood. Ugh. Ugh, it was yucky. Well, what about uh, middle school? So, where were you living yeah. then? Yeah. So, we moved around a bit and then <coughs> moved into this area that was closer to the Jewish community center. <laughs> they were so Jewish. And we moved and then and my mother met uh okay, my sister's walking down the road. My mm -hmm. my sister's five years older than me. She's walking down the road, somebody stops and asks her for directions and then they start talking and she brings him to the house. And he's from Kuwait with the Air Force or something. Mm -hmm. There's all those bases around San yeah. Antonio. So, so um, he meets my mother. His name is Abdullah. Go figure. And, he, <laughs> and his friend's name is Aziz. And that was a whole era in the household, the Abdullah-Aziz era. Um, so my folks had been Jewish like what? Three years, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm going on twelve when we move into this house. Okay. Near the Jewish community center. Near the Jewish community center, <laughs> and um, okay. I want to get my chronology right. Okay, and then I said, <coughs> I don't want to do this bat mitzvah thing. I don't believe in the. I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So I got out of that. Because I had been in the training and everything. Um, 
And by the way, for the record, a uh, canter would come over and have me pick him up, which meant one hand by his balls and the other hand on his chest, and he would show me how to balance him. And it was like, oh, now put your hand here. Let's try canter. Wow. Icky. When you're 12, that's icky. Was he little? No. Oh, so he wasn't. Okay. No, he was man sized yeah. man. I mean, to me, I was 12. But uh, anyway, um, so I got out of that. We got mezuzah on the door, we got menorahs, yeah, all this accoutrement of your right. Age, Jewish, right? right? The time. And so my mother meets Abdullah and Aziz. And she is transfixed. She is. She is. I don't know what happened, but suddenly she has an obsession for camels and coal. They bring her coal, you know, the eye coal. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And she would do it, and this is scary because she's very, very white. Very, very, very white skin, huge blue eyes, mm-hmm. like the piercing huge blue eyes, dyed her hair black, and her hair was like, she liked the freedom curl perm thing, mm-hmm. so like a fro. And uh, so imagine that with the coal, with the heavy coal. So now she really looks like, don't look at me, you know, like when we'd go to Mexico or something, and people would walk by and do this with their eyes, you know, mm-hmm. like, don't give me the evil eye. You know, uh, now she really looks like that. She's got to does the whole coal and starts dressing differently. And mm-hmm. she, she was weird. Do you remember what religion? They were Muslim. Okay. And she converted. She converted to Islam. She converted to Islam. So now everything's like Islam. And what about um, your father? He was. They divorced. Okay. Yeah, the Jewish thing didn't work. I guess because he bought he bought this house. In a like a lower middle income place, which mm-hmm. is a huge step up for us, and it was awesome. You know, I thought it was awesome, and then they got divorced, and now he's like got his business. He had started a business, and he's got to pay for this house and now child support, and he's living where, with what, you know, it really sucked for him. Poor guy. So. Yeah, I don't know if that was just a strategic thing on her part or what. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. He's more into Edgar Casey and things like that. I don't know what happened to the Jewish trip. But she became, like, all about Islam. And she was Fatima. She changed her name to Fatima. And we used to make fun of her relentlessly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Me and my little brother, because we were the only ones still at home. Oh my gosh, that yeah. And um, so she didn't try to um, teach us anything about the religion, okay. um, or promote it in any way. Just that you know. I mean, I remember her saying to me one day that she really and heard it from a boyfriend too really, really hope that one day you learn to have faith. You know? But how does she know I didn't have faith? I just didn't have faith in what she had faith in. Mm-hmm. You know? Wow. Now, did she do the prayers? And did she... Five times a day. She had her little prayer rug. Mm-hmm. She had it in her bedroom, and she would close that door. And you just wow. didn't see her. So by this time now, I'm like... It was after the Jewish era, so I was 12 when that ended because I was like, no, about mitzvah. So, uh, 13, 14. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like uh, 13, 14, mm-hmm. and I remember that. And then she hooked up with a Lebanese priest who was not Muslim, some kind of. What are they in Lebanon? Well, um, it's Christian Orthodox. 
Yeah. Uh, many of them are Christian yeah. Orthodox. Yeah. That's and I think that's what it was. And she okay. kind of hooked up with him, and uh, I think they were actually hooked up. She was so private and secretive about everything. You can always know what's going on. Um, but uh, but at any rate, she didn't push the Muslim thing on us. But she did have camels everywhere and. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, we would just make fun of her, you know, and and, um, and she'd wear the coal and things like that. But she didn't try to make me wear headgear, or, you know, headgear, you know, <laughs> anything like did that. She wear, did she wear a um, a shawl? Did she wear a head sometimes, covering? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes, mm. sometimes she, would, you know, she and one of them gave her a dishdasha, and she would wear that all the time, you know. And she learned to cook some of the foods, like Kuwaiti foods mm -hmm. and stuff. And we went to some relatives of Abdul Aziz. Um, there, maybe I don't know where it was. Their family was staying somewhere. I mean, I mean, it was in San Antonio. It wasn't like we traveled. Mm -hmm. But we went somewhere to somebody's house. Maybe it was friends of theirs. I thought it was relatives. Um, but it was an all Kuwaiti Muslim household. And all these women and some kids. And we were supposed to go over there. My mother, myself, and uh, somebody else. But I don't remember who. And we were supposed to help them prepare dinner. And then mm -hmm. the men were going to come over and have dinner or whatever. And the deal was, one, it's a sit down on the floor dinner with eat with your hands dinner mm -hmm. that's cool I can do that um, but it was like you cannot absolutely not and by this time I'm a teenager and all I do is listen to music you know that's mm -hmm. I may have music in my ear constantly cannot play a radio in the house absolutely no music in the house is forbidden forbidden mm. and you can't wear shorts or anything you know so I had to like dress fully mm -hmm. and no music and be around all these women cooking, which I hated, mm -hmm. you know. It's like, don't put me in that hole, mm -hmm. you know. And um, and I'm scared because I'm scared I'm going to say something wrong mm -hmm. and offend somebody not even knowing because I don't live by all those rules. Right. You know. And I'm an American teenager. I'm likely to say something wrong. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's quite an experience. The food is good. But... I couldn't really communicate with anybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what were you thinking personally, okay, growing up as a, as a teenager? Uh, what was going on in your mind, spiritually, or in your heart, religiously, or anything like that? Um, I felt like nature was my source of spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. That I felt it strongly there. Definitely not in people or any image of people mm -hmm. or anything else. No evidence of anything beautiful happening anywhere else. Right. You know. So to me, it was always in plants. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, later when I got to see the ocean, you know, I'm um, maybe 13, 14, mm -hmm. I got to see the ocean for the first time, it's definitely there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, but that's, that's where the, the powers of the world are. Did you ever have, um, like as a teenager um, or adolescent, did you ever have any kind of supernatural what you would classify as supernatural experiences? Things moving. Things moving? What would move? Um, I had, I can't remember what it was. What the object was, like a stuffed animal. I didn't play with dolls, so it was like more like a stuffed animal or 
figurine of some sort. I was always trying to move stuff with my mind, you know? And Telekinesis? Yeah, so I was trying to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, why can't I do that? You know? Um, but, um, you know, things like that. Like, I would put it there, and, um, and I don't see it move, but it moves, and I know nobody was around, and I didn't move it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Ouija I had a friend who in middle school we were the bestest friends and, and um, born on the same day October 22nd and um, with this same sense of humor and we just got along so well mm-hmm. and uh, we would play Ouija and we would play it, it, it only worked at her house and it wouldn't work with other friends. Like when we'd have other friends come over to her house mm-hmm. for sleepovers, it wouldn't work. It was only with her and I. And we got a backstory um, of the ghost that would move the thing around. Mm-hmm. So it was like this French guy, Michel, who died in, um, he died in his car, like drowned in his car, in a flood. And, um, so he was there and he assured us that, you know, he would not harm anybody, but he was just like in the in-between. I couldn't seem to go through. So we would talk to him and it was just a matter of course for us after school. Hey, you want to come over? Let's talk to Michelle. Cool. You know, Mm -hmm. I would just go, it was like a friend. You know, I don't know how normal that is. And I don't know what other people experience with a Ouija board. Mm-hmm. But I never experienced nothing like that. I mean that thing would whiz through the board. Like it would it would be it wouldn't be like, Oh, I think it's moving. It'd be like Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so we would just talk we would, we were able to just have conversations with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but he spoke English. Yeah. But right back in right back in English. <laughs> I mean, I think he lived in the States. Oh, okay. I don't remember, but it seemed like, like, seemed like he lived in the States and he had a French name. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's very interesting. Now, was your friend, was she any particular religion or spirituality? Or no. No. We both had, um, you know, fascination with um, supernatural things. Mm-hmm. Did you have any other supernatural practices? Any other things that you did? Tarot or yeah, I did tarot. In there. Yeah, I did tarot. I, I I didn't do tarot until maybe my twenties. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so, anything else about your teenage years? About your this is great. You're painting a really nice picture here. Um, my teenage years were so crazy. I, I mean, my teenage years were spent mostly um, in a drunken and drug haze. Mm-hmm. Was it heavy drugs? Yes. Was hot? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, super alcoholic at 16. And it just went downhill. And by the time I was 19, I was, like, shooting up. Mm. 18, 19. I was shooting up and uh, just freaking out. And uh, so you did graduate high school though? No, I did not. You did not graduate high school. Not that's what I dropped out. <laughs> you dropped I dropped out. out of high school. Okay, so you dropped. And where were you living? Are you still in Texas? Uh huh. Okay, still in so San Antonio. Still in that house that my dad had bought. Mm-hmm. I went from being a um, super smart, you know. A student, gymnast, cross country, track, drama, art, to I couldn't go to school without somebody trying to buy drugs from me or sell drugs to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like overnight. It was drastic and just swift, it, it, and it was like I couldn't get away from it. I just like I just couldn't. It was mm-hmm. like somebody had 
dipped me into in something and that I couldn't remove. Mm-hmm. And all I did was attract people who used or sold and just trouble all the time. Just constant, constant trouble. And it was like, it wasn't like my life was happy before mm-hmm. or good, but it sure got worse, like to the extent of which I could not have ever imagined. And I never lost the sense that of, you know, the magic in life and, and how things work, but I had things working in a way that's negative. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I had all the power in the world. It was just, I had it turned the wrong way. You know, but it's the same power I use now. Same exact power I use now. I just had it turned the wrong way. And I couldn't turn it around. It took years and years and years and years to turn it around. Mm-hmm. You know? And spiritually, I never... Mm, because I didn't have a God that let me down. You know I mean? I didn't have a, a God that had rules on me. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have a God that let me down. You know? I didn't have a God that I disappointed, you know, it was just. Were your parents disappointed? My dad didn't know. How could he not know? He didn't know, he thought, he thinks to this day that I graduated high school. Um, he saw me once in the morning and said, you have alcohol on your breath. I'm like, yeah, I had a couple of beers last night. And no further question. And mm-hmm. I just stay away. I didn't have much contact with him for a long time. And what about your mom? Um, she just didn't know what to do, I guess, because she didn't do anything. Were you living with your dad at the no, time? No, I was living with my mother. Living with your mom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If I had been living with my dad, things would have been different, but he would have done something. Mm-hmm. He's not as afraid. Mm-hmm. But her is like, okay, a uh, cop brings me home, I'm underage. I smashed up somebody's car, drunk, no license, not my car. She doesn't do shit. Mm-hmm. You know, I get suspended from school for smoking pot in school. Doesn't do shit. Um, come on, drunk all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, um, she doesn't know I'm using drug, drug, drugs. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, yeah. There was one time I was laying on my bed, um, and I thought I was gonna die. I was dope sick and didn't know. Dope sick? Oh yeah, like I needed to shoot up and I didn't. Mm, and so okay. I was sick, and I didn't know that that's what it was because I hadn't been doing it very long at that point. Mm-hmm. I thought I was going to die. I'm like, oh my God, they're going to find me here dead on my bed, roll up my sleeves, and see these needle marks. And nobody nobody knew. Like, nobody knew what mm-hmm. I was doing. Wow. So, you know, people don't know how to handle it, you know. Like, now there's more resources mm-hmm. and more knowledge and, and stuff like that. But I think even in, in today's world, my mother, she was so just unskilled. Mm-hmm. and afraid mm-hmm. she still wouldn't have done anything and I had asked her for help at one point like I see a psychiatrist before mm-hmm. I started all the craziness mm-hmm. I was like please 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 can I no no mm-hmm. and she wouldn't talk about anything I'm like please tell me this tell me that no no you know and uh, I think she was just so scared mm-hmm. and was probably what compelled her to religion shop the way she did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. So this was, so you didn't graduate high school and you were still living at your mom's Kind house, of. Kind yeah, of. Yeah, I was in an, I, you know, and like, so early, and so like through your 20s, <coughs> what 
happened. Well, that so. was that changed. I mean, like when I was about nineteen, nineteen, actually, I was living with somebody. I mean, with this guy, not my boyfriend. Mm-hmm. I I wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Um, but uh, living with this guy and uh kind of a biker dude and we would shoot up together mm-hmm. and uh, then one day um, my friend comes to where I, was, I actually had a job I was able to hold a job kind of for six months at a time basically and uh, she comes to my job and says that Joe has split town and there's an eviction notice in the, on the door and the place has been ransacked mm-hmm. so I go there and like all my stuff had been like just one up and mm-hmm. the most painful thing was my I had been in gymnastics and I mm-hmm. competed and all my ribbons and stuff and certificates yeah I'm just like strung on stepped on and just yeah you know, I've been violated and that yeah. was the only thing I cared about and when all you know I didn't have much stuff I was just a teenager with nothing you know yeah. a bed and a dresser drawer so that's it um but the only thing that made that had any value to me was those ribbons. Oh, you know, yeah. It's like the only meaningful thing. So I just walked away, you know. And um, I had a boyfriend at the time, and he was like, "If you don't go live with your mother, I'm breaking up with you." And I'm like, "Fuck." So I asked my mother if I could stay, you know. Mm-hmm. So I stayed on the couch, you know. So I kind of lived there for a minute. Mm-hmm. But she was super dependent super dependent on me go figure but she had always been since I was like 12 you know mm-hmm. like rely on me like I was an adult like ask me for advice fuck I'm 12 you yeah. know like yeah. I've never even whatever I haven't done any of this stuff right so I don't know what I'm talking about mm-hmm. it was like I was level headed mm-hmm. people always said oh you're so poised and mm-hmm. you know whatever but I'm still not an adult mm-hmm. you know but that's how she treated me so like when I was sitting on the couch or whatever she's, she's crazy she decided that she wanted to move to Phoenix, Arizona she had a sister there and her mom was there she's never been close to either but she decided she wanted to move there I don't know what the deal what she was going through you know she must have been in her early 50s. Okay. So, whatever she was dealing with at the time. Mm-hmm. 50 then is quite different from 50 now. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, so, she asked me if I will move with her to Phoenix because she does not want to be alone. And she's more like pleading mm-hmm. with me. Yeah. You know? And I feel horribly, horribly guilty for all that I've put her through mm-hmm. because none of what she's put me through has any importance mm-hmm. you know I'm totally like turned around yeah I have no sense of like you can step on me everybody does so go ahead yeah you know um but yeah I owed everybody so I felt so guilty so incredibly guilty and I didn't know how I'd be able to stand living with her because I couldn't stand being around her at all mm-hmm. I mean I just couldn't stand her energy mm-hmm you know? Yeah. Couldn't stand it. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. You know? Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Like thinking I can work off the guilt, you know? Right. So I do. I go to Phoenix with her and have an apartment with her. And I'm like dying, you know? I'm like, I have my own room with a walk in closet and I sit in the walk in closet and drink all the time because I can't find any drugs. You know, mm-hmm. new city, and I really would like to clean up. So, I don't, I avoid places I, you know, yeah. you can find them when you want them. Right. <laughs> Figure out where to go. In Phoenix, it's pretty easy, but just like, I don't want to find any drugs. I want to get, just see if I can, like, wash this label off. Mm hmm. And so, I go to Phoenix with her, right? Oh my god, it's just killing me. She wants to spend Friday night watching videos on MTV. Had just, you know, it's like mm-hmm. 30 names. 
I just want to watch MTV videos and get a pizza. And I'm just like dying. I'm like, I can't do this. <coughs> and I had a cousin who's about my age, but 20 years younger, you know, mm -hmm. just like sheltered and naive. And she would come over, and I'd just be dying in there. Mm -hmm. I was used to such a different life. You yeah. Know? And they're trying to square me out, and it was just like incredibly uncomfortable, and I had to drink. Mm -hmm. You know? And I'd be restless if I wasn't drinking, and restless when I was, and I don't know, it was just miserable. And she couldn't understand why I wasn't around. And she wanted to be pals and go places and go shopping. I said, I'm going to go shopping with you. You know, it's like, and yeah. I'm to try so hard. Mm -hmm. I try so hard. And at that time, she wasn't doing any, she wasn't praying five times a day or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened with all that at that point. So, I don't know. So then we ended, it, was, it lasted eight months. She couldn't get along with her sister. Mm hmm didn't like Phoenix. Mm -hmm. she didn't, I don't know what she liked. She didn't like anything. She didn't like anything. I don't like the hot. Why are you moving to the desert? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So what happened then? Then she, um, she, what happened? We ended up coming here to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. My boyfriend, I had a boyfriend in Phoenix. And, uh, He had a cousin or something that lived here, mm -hmm. and so we were able to connect with him um, to kind of get a little view of the city or whatever, but she decided she wanted to move here, so she said, please come with me or whatever. Oh my God, how long is this going to take, mm -hmm. you know? So... Um, quit my jobs and everything. She worked for a psychic. Mm, yeah. No, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an astrologist. Oh, okay. And she was over there. That was kind of neat because I had my chart read. And I'm uh, all hung over. Um, so you're in Atlanta? Yeah. So we moved to Atlanta. I was like 83. I'd been clean for like, well, off of hard drugs for like a year, mm -hmm. close to a year. Mm -hmm. That was nice. And um, I had never done like any sort of NA or CA or anything like mm -hmm. that. You know, she never met and coke, most of that. And so anyway, so we get here. We get an apartment in College Park. She sees some dark man with dark eyes, a handsome face, and they hook up. Mm -hmm. He's African. I don't know what his religion is. <laughs> I don't know if he had one. He was, he was some kind of local politician guy. Mm -hmm. He was nasty. He was nasty. And then, so I come home one day and there's a tall young woman in the apartment who I've never met. And uh, she tells me that my mother has moved out um, and is, um, has married this guy. And she's his sister, and she's going to be living there now. <laughs> wow, okay. Wow. So, that was weird. I end up on crack um, months later. Mm -hmm. I meet this guy at my job, and... He introduces me to crack, and we're up all night doing crack, and I'm like, I cannot believe this, because here I am again, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that was another few years. It was horrible. It was just horrible. I, was home. I ended up homeless. I was raped for the second time. It's just trashed. Mm -hmm. 
as a human being. You know? What were you thinking about like during those years, or were you thinking about anything religiously or spiritually? Were you still like praying to the moon? Was there anything going on in that direction? I was just hung by a thread, you know, to everything. It was like, I, I knew there was order to life, mm-hmm. and I was on the wrong side of that order, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, on the side that I didn't want to be. Not necessarily wrong, but just yeah. the side I didn't want to be. It's like, I always had a sense of, like, you look at nature, nature, it looks chaotic, and it's in perfect order. Mm-hmm. You know? And it, and it follows, it, it follows cycles. It's, it's perfect. Nature is perfect to me. Mm-hmm. In its imperfection, you know? Mm-hmm. Haphazardly arranged and but always beautiful mm-hmm. you know yeah. and I wouldn't I didn't have any any sort of rituals or anything intermittently throughout those years in my early 20s in the late teens early 20s I would study what I could find about um, pagans mm-hmm. um, witchcraft, Wiccans, things like that, nature religions and and um you know, I learned to read tarot cards and things like that. I taught myself. I think that was a little bit later in my mid mid twenties. So intermittently but when things were really rough, when I'm just like, where am I gonna live and how am I gonna get through this day? Mm-hmm. There's nothing. Okay. You know, nothing. Hierarchy of yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, how did you eventually? When did you eventually get on the other side of the <laughs> order? Yeah, um, I um, going to die mm-hmm. or become psychotic because it feels like that when you're coming down from a really long binge. Mm-hmm. It feels like you're going psychotic. And I never went to the hospital not once because I was scared that I would be then like, intercepted uh-huh. and put in the system and everything would be made worse. Mm-hmm. I never went to treatment and I wanted to so bad. Mm-hmm. I never went to treatment because I would lose my apartment. I didn't have anything to, or anybody to rely on. Mm-hmm. And if I lost everything again, you know, like I finally got an apartment and a job. I found a job at a hair salon. These people were a godsend. They didn't know what I was. Mm-hmm. And I thought I was cute and intelligent, you know, which I was, but they didn't see the rest. Mm-hmm. They saw good, you know. Right. And they gave me a job. And they gave me cash mm-hmm. each week, and I was, I tried so hard to just 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 keep my apartment, just keep my apartment, you know. Mm-hmm. And the whole time living with a dopey drug drug head boyfriend, mm-hmm. you know, the crack crackhead that turned out crack. So when I I realized one day it was just like I have I have to change everything. Like I have to get out of this. Like I have to bust out of it. Mm-hmm. Somehow I have to just get out of this mm-hmm. without going to treatment or anything. So I told my boyfriend, it's like, you gotta go. Mm-hmm. Because I gotta clean up. I have to. Yeah. I have to because I'm gonna die using, you know. And I'm 25 or something, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm like, I've been doing this hard for 10 years, you know. I can't do it. I always had a sense like that I had um, thought I was gifted, mm-hmm. you know, and not not the human trash that I was living the life of, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And I suppose that's what people call a survival instinct or something. Because if you really believed you were trash, you would just let yourself go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah. you just die by the pipe or whatever it is, you know. So, 
I wanted to, you know, because I always had interests, mm -hmm. intellectual curiosities, mm -hmm. you know, and couldn't get my groove on at all, right. you know, so it, my, le my lease was up on, like, at the end of the year, and um, so we parted on New Year's Eve, you know, spent New Year's Eve together, and then it was like, okay, time to move, and I moved in. Um, a guy that I worked with mm -hmm. who two months later or less had AIDS and he had AIDS but it got so bad and he didn't know that's mm -hmm. what, he, what it was and mm -hmm. so I, was, I couldn't stay in that apartment too long but um, like I, I really really tried to get off the hard drugs I didn't realize I had an alcohol problem I know that's crazy because I was super alcoholic but I didn't realize that was the problem, mm -hmm. you know. And you know, if you ever been to an Amy, you'll hear that. He go what? <laughs> <laughs> but somehow you just don't realize, you know. Somehow it's weird. Sometimes you don't realize it, you know. I mean, I had a boyfriend who had an alcoholic mom when he was seventeen. Told me when I was seventeen, he told me, "You're a problem." I was like, "He's like, I know because I know about it. I go to Al-Anon, my mom's all." You know, like I didn't get it. Right. I just right. didn't get it. Right. It wasn't. I mean, I don't. I think denial is that you know it and you're not letting yourself know it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know. You know, just, okay, I don't see it. But um, so I I wanted to quit. You know, using coke and stuff. And I got tested. I mean, people gave me some guy gave me a rock, like a huge rock, and I was so scared of it. I was so scared of it. And I was like, and it wasn't cooked down like you would put it in a pipe. It was like you shave it off and snort it. Mm -hmm. Rock. I mean, it was huge. It was like these things will happen to me. You know, get in a car with some guy. He doesn't sex me out. Gives me uh, this giant rock. And uh, I'm like, wow. But I'm so scared of this thing because I know that it'd be my downfall, and I'll be right back in, and it's the end of my life. Because mm -hmm. you only. You know, most addicts could at that point. You know when your time is up, and so um, I was like, I don't like to be scared to that extent of anything. So I made myself shave off a little and snort a little, and it was horrible. Like it was horrible. Mm -hmm. Like give me a panic attack, kind of horrible. Although I didn't have a full attack or whatever, but it's like that feeling. And I gave it to a girl at school at George State. I gave it to a girl at George State <laughs> <laughs> from my, one of my psych classes. Because I was in school. And, um, yeah, I was in school this whole time. Like, I would take a class a quarter and then have to take off because I'd be having breakdowns. You know? It's crazy. But I got through in five years. I got my degree in five years. And, and I paid for the whole thing out of my pocket. And psychology? Sociology. Sociology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Criminal justice and sociology. And, um, whew. So I was still drinking, like, bad. But... I wasn't using anything, and I saved money because I was I didn't have that expensive apartment, you know, because I was sharing an apartment with somebody. Because my uncle had boyfriend never paid rent mm -hmm. or anything, just bought drugs, and um, I I'd never done anything like this before. Nobody in my family had ever done anything like this before. But I just had a notion to go to Cancun to give myself a vacation, mm -hmm. and it was like the first nice thing I ever did for myself. Like I saved up enough money in a few months mm -hmm. to um, go to Cancun and I got a package deal I mean I've never done and it was so it was like it was like somebody in my family going to college that this shit didn't happen you know yeah. you know what I mean it's like so I remember like it was crazy and I and and, um, and I got like you know one of those uh, three night four day things or something mm -hmm. you know packages to Cancun and it was awesome and I, and I think that's one of those things that you go, I can do this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I can have a good life, I have a life, you know. It was really empowering. And uh, I like being in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I like all that Day of the Dead stuff yeah. and all that. It's real comfortable. It's like comforting yeah. to me. Yeah. All yeah. that yeah. Virgin yeah. Mary stuff. And 
So that's when that's how I got off. I just made myself not do it, mm-hmm. and um, I just made myself not do it. And um, I tried to um, like let myself meet people who weren't in that life, mm-hmm. and make myself be uncomfortable. You know, like let myself be uncomfortable because you're in that life and you don't know how to deal with straight people. It's mm-hmm. like very uncomfortable to be around straight people and and uh, so I like just taught myself, you know, like you just have to be okay with that discomfort. Right. You know. And you have to learn from them. You have to be with straight people and watch them, you know, observe them and learn from them mm-hmm. and mimic them. Mm-hmm. Because what you know is attracting what you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I like, I could see what was at operation. You know, what was off, op- I could see what was operating. Mm-hmm. You know, without having ever read any science of mind books or anything like that. It's just because it's nature. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a natural law. Mm-hmm. So, it took a while and then it worked. Mm-hmm. And I got off. And you never went to AA or? I went to AA when I'm um, like five and a half years ago or something. I finally got sober. Mm-hmm. Um, but AA sucks so incredibly much that I don't go anymore. I mean, I stopped after a few years. Um, by go. sucks, you mean? <laughs> oh, I'm still sober. I was, I no, I mean by sucks. You said AA. Oh, I thought you said by stops. Um, sucks. A sucks. Um, a sucks because well, for one, my sister, let me count the ways. But for one, the whole um, as we understood him, higher power. It's and they say, well, we don't push this on you, and it's open to any sort of spirituality. But the language. Is Judeo Christian. The principles are all Judeo Christian. Twelve steps and everything, mm-hmm. where they teach you how to get sober or what have you. You know, um, they talk about everything but drinking in AA. You know, but but when we go back to the steps, like the steps, uh, I I admit my powerlessness over alcohol. Bullshit. I am not powerless over alcohol. I don't have to put it in my body. When it's in my body, my body does not metabolize it correctly. It doesn't mm-hmm. make me powerless over it. I'm very much um, in full possession of power. You know? Mm-hmm. Right. Like, I don't dig that at all. Okay. And then the whole thing about... Um, <laughs> See, I don't even remember the step so well. I wanted to, have to ask him, well, what step is that? Um, God as we understand him. Ooh, that's a party foul. You just called it a hymn, mm-hmm. you know? So what am I, to imagine a male figure or something? Or, you know, that doesn't work for me. Right. It doesn't work for me. Right. Um, so yeah, the whole the the steps like I get what they're doing. I get what the steps are for, but but um, uh, for me, um, as a person with um alcoholism, I read everything I could get my hands on. Mm-hmm. I mean, I started reading books like um, Under the Influence. And began to understand the the um, neurobiology mm-hmm. of alcoholism and stuff. That um, then I started going in and instead of saying, "Hi, I'm Maria, I'm an alcoholic," which I never liked saying because it's like, "Don't label me," mm-hmm. you know. It doesn't right. serve me. Right. I don't, I don't have any denial about this. I came in right on my own volition. I don't have any denial about it. It doesn't serve me. So I would say. Um, my name is Maria. I have an addictive biochemistry. <laughs> Did anybody hear you? Oh, and they would laugh hard. 
every time. I go in the same meeting every week, two, three times a week. And they would still laugh every time. And then people started getting pissed off, you know, um, because I'm happy, um, because I would come in, I would talk about nutrition mm -hmm. and um, running and exercise. Because I think when you get sober, you know, um, I think especially from alcohol, because of the physical damage, mm -hmm. and that um, that you really need to um, change your diet, mm -hmm. and you really need to get some exercise, and um, you really need to uh, do these things to help your body heal, right? And to to um, To stay sober, you have to just not take the first drink. Mm -hmm. As long as I don't drink any alcohol, I won't drink any alcohol. I mean, you know, yes. <laughs> I I can't stop at one. I, this thing kicks in in my brain. Mm -hmm. We call it the ape shit switch. <laughs> it turns on and it's off to the races, and it's like I don't even think about it. Yeah. You know, it's automatic. I don't think about it. I don't, it, and I used to marvel at that. It's like, how do people have a drink or two and they know to stop? Like, I don't, it never even occurs to me. I don't recognize when I'm drunk. Like, other people say, oh, I'm feeling tipsy. I'm going to stop now. And it's like, wow, what are you experiencing? Because that's not at all my experience when I'm, when I'm drinking. Mm -hmm. Not at all. It's a completely different thing. And, um, um, now that I understand, like what happens in the in the metabolism right. of alcohol, oh, okay, I get now why other people like have that sense. Yeah. You know, I get that. Um, so you know, a, a the follows a, a book that was written in 1935 when they didn't have mm -hmm. um, any of this information, and um, dude was trying to sell a book so that he could start a hospital for drunks. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't, and, and they're very strict about you don't bring in any other literature. Oh. And I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, we have new information and it could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Do you want to keep that? Yeah. You know, uh, from people? Um, because why? Mm -hmm. You know? So it's, there's a lot I don't agree with. And, and basically, they just kind of spit me out because I'm too happy. And they were like, um, you know, because, uh, I guess, I don't know, people are quite miserable, you know, mm -hmm. they're just miserable, and in, in various states of, um, awareness, mm -hmm. you know, right. and I think a lot of the, the misery and depression and negativity could be turned around the diet, but they're not looking at it. Mm -hmm. They're pumping themselves full of sugar and caffeine in meetings, mm -hmm. and fast food when they're not at meetings, and then coming in and talking about how miserable and depressed they are. What the fuck? You know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm, you know, I just had a salad and a five mile run. I come in, I'm feeling great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And I'm, I'm just happy to be sober. Well, what um, role, if any, does spirituality play in your life today? Do you have any spiritual practices that you do? Mm, yeah, I think I'm spiritual like 24-7, you know? I, mean, I think I just come from a spiritual place. and mm -hmm. um, But I'm on the other side of it now, mm -hmm. you know? Because, like, the way I see it, you know... Like, I practice science of mind. So, but I don't do a whole lot of, like, they do a lot of affirmations and stuff. I don't really dig that, you know? Mm -hmm. I'll use them. Um, but I'm not a big journaler or, you know, affirmation person. Their affirmations are different. They're not like, I'm kind, I'm beautiful, people like me. It's, <laughs> it's not that kind of affirmation, you know? Um... Well, what are the affirmations? They're essentially designed to remind you that um, you are not separate from God. 
you know, that God is something greater than you, and also everything you are is God. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much what they're designed for. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not like, oh, Lord, would you buy me a Mercedes Benz? It's, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I recognize, I acknowledge mm -hmm. um, the divine creative power that exists, you know, all around me, through me, in me that sort of thing, and, and, um, and I'm grateful, mm -hmm. you know, I was expressing gratitude, gratitude is the best thing ever, and, um, and then if, if you have a need, you know, like, uh, I need balance in my life, or I need, um, you know, I don't know, something like me, clarity, Mm -hmm. Something like that, you know, you can throw it in there, knowing that that as you call it in, it's already there. It's mm -hmm. done, you know. <laughs> and I think that's in the Bible when they talk about the Word and the Word. What do, what do they say in the Bible about the Word? In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. That's a good voice. That's a good voice. That's what God sounds like. I yeah. was wondering. In the yeah. Beginning, there was a, yeah. Um, that that's what that is. That's all it is. It's like taking taking a thought because everything came from nothing. You take a thought, which is just ethereal, and and once the thought is cohesive enough to be come words, it's almost physical, mm -hmm. kind of like a fetus. Yeah, you know. And so then when it's out, you say your word and it's out there. And if you act upon that word, then you bring physical, you bring it into physical existence, mm -hmm. you know. So I know that anything that I want, what love wants, yeah, I get mm -hmm. anything. Because it's just a natural law. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like if I, if I think it and I speak it and I act upon it, all I'm doing is attracting energy to it. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. And I do it all the time. You know? I do it all the time. And it's just a conscious awareness of, of being in alignment mm -hmm. with your own standards of integrity, mm -hmm. you know? With what's with what's true for you, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you go to a science of mind church at all? Mm -hmm. Which one do you go to? Trinity. It's, it's on Zona Light. It's over there okay. off of Briarcliff. Yeah, yeah. I really, really like it. I mean, the first time I went to a science of mind church, I went to the one that they do at the Art Center. That just moved. Yeah, they just yeah. moved. And Paul Gagne was the um, pastor over there. Um, and I've I've been to many churches because I like a I like an experience like that. I like mm -hmm. a conscious shifting experience. Um, you know, it's not do drugs anymore. I'm not smoking some weed, you know? And for some reason I have no problem with weed. Mm -hmm. Like it can sit in my house forever. Mm -hmm. I smoke it once. I I don't get any obsession. There's no mm -hmm. issue it's switching my body for weed. It's so cool. Um so you were talking about you went to Zona Light then? Yeah, I go to Zona Light every Sunday. I'm in a music ensemble. I sing. Um, um, yeah, I'm hooked in. It's like, I like it. I like the people that go there. They're not so frilly, you know? <laughs> well, because, you know, like, you can go to some of those, like, New Thought or Unitarian churches or something, and, and the ladies are frilly, -fru you know? Like, I don't know. I don't do the angels and all that kind of stuff and I don't want your hands and energy all over me like trying to fix me and shit you know yeah. it's like we have people we do have Reiki practitioners and I'll, I'll engage in that freely like we have one lady she's a seer and she does Reiki and she's excellent and she has helped me so much so much and I'll have these experiences like and I'm glad that I have the background I have because I'm comfortable completely in that world mm -hmm. completely comfortable in that world like I went to her I was so 
kind of sorts, you know, from uh, discovering fans from. And, uh, and I went to her, and I was, I was getting therapy, I was doing counseling and stuff, but it wasn't reaching, mm -hmm. you know. So I went to Diane, and uh, she puts me on the table, and, um, and no frou-frou, man. She just, you lie on the table, she covers you with blankets so you're not cold. And um, then she squats around you and does her thing, you know. There's no frou for She doesn't gibberish on you. She doesn't mm -hmm. sprinkle nothing on you, you know. Um, she just does her work. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, she'll talk to you afterwards, fr frankly, about anything mm -hmm. that she saw or felt or whatever. And, yeah. and talk, and it's very, very helpful. Um, and I and and as soon as I lay down and close my eyes and she started, I could feel the. I guess they're people, but I don't really know people things mm -hmm. coming and surrounding around mm -hmm. the table, you know, like protective presence. Mm -hmm. But they were like cloaked, you know, like I couldn't see anybody. I couldn't see faces or anything like that, but I clearly see the figure outline yeah and feel the presence mm -hmm. um and um didn't you know say anything to her like oh there are people coming um but she asked me about it you know uh -huh. if i had felt that you know because she saw them too and stuff and it wasn't people she called in it was like people came coming for me you right. know like i have some major protectors out there which i always felt i did mm -hmm. Because I've been I had a lot of near this, near that experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <my laughs> yeah. I'm totally protected, you know. I feel like I have a pretty good connection between um, this world and the next. You know, the veil's not so thick for me. Okay. It's what it feels like. Wow. This has been really good. This is um, excellent. Um, one last question, and then we are going to move to some specific Georgia State questions. Um, how do you identify yourself religiously now, or spiritually, if somebody were to ask you? I would say um, I practice science of mind. Okay, so you're a science of mind. Mm -hmm. and, yoga, <laughs> and yoga, I mean, I live a yoga lifestyle, so mm -hmm. without the vegetarianism. <laughs> wow. Okay. And, uh, all right, we're going to talk, think back to, you've actually been to Georgia State mm -hmm. twice. Mm -mm. I just did my undergrad there. Okay, and then where'd you I did my master's online. That's right, okay. Mm -hmm. So so I want you to think back to your um, undergraduate going to Georgia State. Mm -hmm. um, and what is your strongest memory, <coughs> if any, of religion or spirituality associated with Georgia State? Or in anything, school? just anything. The school nothing. is nothing. Blank. Nothing. Blank. You're running a blank here. Okay. Yeah, nothing. I mean, the first thing that came to mind was, you know, an anthropology class because you study those things, you know, yeah. different cultures. But, and, you know, and then I thought about drunk um, criminal justice instructor. And then Ellison, who I adore. And then there was this really cute guy who taught a psych class. That, that's all I remember. Okay. I don't, yeah. Did you ever talk to other students? Hardly. Okay. Not unless I <laughs> had. You didn't talk to them at all, much less about religion or spirituality. Right. No, no. Um, ever hang out with the guys in the park? Um, Woodruff Park? In Woodruff Park? No, because I went to school at night. I worked all day and then I went to school at night. And okay. then. The last year I went during the day because I, there were classes that I had to take during the day. Okay. Do you remember any 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 um, any groups that invited you to join them? Maybe, maybe. protests. Nothing. So really, protests. Yeah, there was a um, the KKK facing down 
some anti KKKers downtown in front of Woodruff Park. Okay. My last year, I worked at the Department of Corrections uh, office, downtown office of substance abuse. Um, I had been a correctional officer like my two years in my study, so. Mm-hmm. Uh, And then, um, so it was kind of easy for me to get. Right. I got an internship at the Department of Corrections. Um, paid internship. And so I go downtown, and so yeah, I remember there was that protest. Um, guys would yell at me, um, homeless guys would yell at me downtown because I shaved my head. Um, what did you shave your head? Just wanted to. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I was crushing on because I had a mohawk. And my hair was so long, though, I could wear it down. Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't really know that my whole yeah. head would say, but it was pretty. Mm-hmm. You know, I would French braid it mm-hmm. all the way down. It wasn't like I was trying to go, oh, you know, yeah. pins in my nose or anything. It was, <laughs> it was pretty. And it was yeah. so easy because I could wake up and go, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And my, I can carry it with my face, so. Um, yeah, I don't, in terms of Georgia State rep having any. Okay. Man. You said, um, but say, I guess during that time was when you were kind of into, um, like tarot and, and, mm-hmm. and l- l- exploring some things like that. Um, did you know anybody else that was into that? Um, mm-hmm. and did you kind of see yourself as different? For most of the people down there because of that? I saw myself as different um, from many of the people that I was in school with because I'd had a crazy life okay. um, with all the drugs and the experiences of being, you know, just physical abuses that I had incurred mm-hmm. and mental places that I had gone that were so dark and intense and deep that you, know, you feel separate. Okay. You know, now when I would see a girl in the class that I was like, she's a stripper, I could relate to her. You had strippers in your class? Yeah, I remember I, there was one in my French class, and I'm like, I know you're a stripper. I know you're a stripper. You should, we can tell each other, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And, you know, people in the life can tell other people in the life, you know. You can dress different or whatever, but we can tell, mm-hmm. you know. And... So those people, like I could, I could relate to, but I wouldn't openly connect to them, okay. like because to do that then invites more mm-hmm. of the same, and I'm trying to get out of it. Okay. So I know to be different, I have to be different. Mm-hmm. Nothing changes, and nothing changes, kind of thing. So, um, but in terms of. Um, Religiously and stuff, I've always been intimidated by Christians, like, or not intimidated, fearful mm-hmm. of Christians um, because, um, you know, like my husband's family, very Christian or Catholic, mm-hmm. I'm always concerned about um, offending them. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I don't want to offend anyone, but I will mm-hmm. accidentally, you know. Yeah. And, um, or I fear that I will accidentally, but right. I'll say the wrong thing. And there's probably been times when I have and, and, um, you know, caught that fear, Yeah. you know, cause it's just, you know, like some people don't like you to curse at all and I'll curse. So I don't care, you mm-hmm. know? <laughs> Every now and again, a fuck will fly out. <laughs> Just come right out of there, yeah. Some people get very offended, you know, I don't mean to offend anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, so, were any of your experiences at Georgia State, um, did they influence your spiritual or your religious life in any way? Anything that happened there? Mm, no, I would say um, studying anthropology. I mean, I only had one class in cultural anthropology, but it was 
I read a lot behind it because mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it. And if it hadn't been my last quarter, yeah, I would have switched my major. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, it was last. So, um, but I would say um, that I don't know about influencing, but in reading about other cultures around the world and stuff, and and understanding their the way that they see the spirit world or natural mm-hmm. order um, watching um, Joseph Campbell right. and Bill Moyers interviewing Joseph Campbell that sort of thing makes me feel like um, okay even though before I ever encountered anything science in mind I had already come up with all that shit on my own mm-hmm. like because it's natural it's the natural world it will appear to you if you open your eyes to it you know what I mean yeah it's not a secret, and it's nothing that has to be transmitted via another human, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but it is nice to know that there's other humans out there with, like, a variety of, of religious and spiritual experiences, that um, that there's other people that um, see the spirit of nature, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. I appreciate the variety of experience. And if someone were uh, to ask you just to describe the religious climate at Georgia State, I'd what say, would you say what religious climate? What religious climate? <laughs> okay. As, um, as it should be for a university. Mm-hmm. You know, I think if I may have an opinion on that. Yeah. Um, and let's see. What do you, um, are there any questions that I've left out or anything else that you think, any experiences that you've had that you think would be important for me to know, to understand your spiritual life? Yeah, I think the first time I took acid, I understood another component of things like that never left me. Um, when was this? I was probably 16. Okay. And I, I, I dropped some acid, some paper. Acid at my house, uh, mother's at work, little brother's somewhere, I don't know, mm-hmm. and I was by myself, and you know, they always tell you that, you know, don't ever do it by yourself, fuck you, man, I don't want to do it with other people, because I'm messing me up, you see, I'm better by myself, right? comfortable here, but I don't want the influence of people who are full of fear and things, you know, mm-hmm. so I'd rather do it by myself, so I did, and, um, I understood how things are not solid. And I don't know why I still can't move stuff with my mind, but I know that things are not solid because I've seen it. <laughs> like, like seeing it on acid, you go, you know, okay, well, I also saw cartoons on acid. Okay, that doesn't mean cartoons are real. But, you know what I mean? But to understand the the amount of space that is between a physical matter that makes it appear solid. Mm-hmm. Like I saw that and it was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Total sense. Because I suspected it. You know? You suspected that things weren't solid. Yeah. And that I, sus- I always suspected that things weren't solid and that everything is alive. You know? Everything. Everything is alive. Rocks, everything. Like people who say, I don't eat food that has a face. Well, then you're going to starve because you just may not recognize it because it doesn't have a nose and an eyes and a mouth like you do. Right. Doesn't mean it doesn't have a face. Right. You know. It's like so. My experiences on acid confirm <laughs> my suspicions <laughs> about things not being solved because because I could see it. I think sometimes those you know like I love all those Carlos Castaneda stories. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, because I think there are things that you know, plants and such that help us bridge our realities. Mm-hmm. You know, because what we see and hear and stuff is so limited. Like, how can you talk about death when you have no way of knowing? Your whole consciousness will change when you die, and you have no way of knowing how it will perceive. Yeah. None. Yeah. It's, it, why even talk about it? Mm-hmm. You know. Anything else? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't know, life is interesting. Um, I, I think one thing I would add, just for the record, is like, in terms of experiencing spirituality in life, um, there's it's available in any to me it's available in anything I might do and all I have to do is very simple is just be aware it's just mm-hmm. open just open to it yeah so like in music the difference between music being in a background noise mm-hmm. you know like lights being on automatic you know it's just background noise I'm really not really in tune to it versus um, playing music and being inside of it and being in a flow that has never happened, that is happening only now and that will never happen again. Mm -hmm. And having that moment to moment level of presence, Mm -hmm. spirituality is there. Mm -hmm. And so available in any, any moment at any time, doing anything. So, like, when the monks talk about, what do they talk about? Like, things that they talk about, polishing sober for 30 days and doing nothing else or whatever. It's, I think the intent is that to learn that in the mundane, is every bit of spiritual mm-hmm. as going to a church with incense or whatever. Yeah. Wow, you know, great. Well, this has been really, really good. This is this is wonderful. I, I look forward to your book. <laughs> <laughs> your, your bestseller. Um, last thing is, I just have to get some demographic information. So, what is your occupation? Um, you have one. I do. Um, currently, director of a community organization. Okay. Um, and when and where were you born? Um, 1962, October 22nd in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. And how do you describe your ethnicity? Hispanic. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what is your educational background? High school dropout, uh, master's degree in public health. Okay. And then you got your undergrad degree in? In, in sociology at Georgia State, yeah. And... Um, was there a problem going to college with that? Uh, no, I got a, a, a GED. GED? Okay. I got a GED. GED, all right. And what is your marital slash partnership status? Um, married but living separately. Okay, and do you have any children? None. Okay, and um, your current GSU affiliation? Um, alumni. Very good. And your current religious affiliation? Science of Mind practitioner. All right. Well, thank you very much. This was really great.